Hello, I'm Alan Zundell for Social Advance, and today we're going to take a look at something a little bit different. We've been covering mostly Oregon politics and focusing after the election on how Democrats are doing vis-a-vis -vis Republicans, but today we're going to expand our focus to the national scene, particularly the U.S. Congress, and contract it to what's going on within the Democratic Party to look at whether progressives are making any headway there after the elections. And we have with us today my friend Alaric Caswell, and he's going to uh, be talking a little bit. He's been following this more closely than I have, so he's here to help inform us about what he sees happening after the election in the U.S. Congress. Hello. Hi. So yeah, I've been following Congress a bit. Um, I don't have an exhaustive list of who's won, who hasn't. Um, some of the elections are still uh, going on. You know, they're still counting, particularly in the states that are uh, at play still in the presidential election. Um, overall, I would say progressives have done well. Um, the incumbents who won in 2018, namely Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, uh, Ilhan Omar, uh, Rashida Tlaib, Ayanna Presley, um, and others like Rokana and Pramila Jayapal, who were incumbents at the time but took the mantle of Justice Democrats, have all won handily, uh, have, have all won their elections. Uh, so that's good, in my opinion. Um, I should be clear, I am not a disinterested party. I am very much a progressive. Uh -huh. uh, so so <laughs> these particular incumbents, are known as the squad. Um, yes. Is that all five of them? I think you mentioned five. They're all regard themselves as part of that. Well, that's if it's not I a membership think, group. It's just an informal label. Yeah, it, yeah. It's just an, an informal term. I believe squad just includes uh, AOC, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, uh, Omar Talib, and Presley. Um, I don't think that uh, Rokan or Jayapal consider themselves part of the squad, but they're all sort of part of the same left progressive, uh, the, a growing caucus within the Democratic Party. So that brings us to another question before we look at um, who did well and who, um, who's new, who's old, who got reelected. How do we define a progressive? Um, I guess there's different organizations that are trying to vet candidates, but I don't know what standards they use. And I often see online people arguing about who is or who isn't a progressive. So do you have a working definition for this? And do you know of one that's being used by some of the organizations that are helping vet these candidates? I have my own personal view of what a progressive is and isn't. And I think it's pretty much in line with the Justice Democrats definition, uh, just for the audience, Justice Democrats uh, was formed by uh, Cenk Uger, Kyle Kulinski, Chakrabarty, I think is his name. I don't know, I'm probably butchering his name. He, he went on to become AOC's uh, chief of staff for a while. But it's a group that vets candidates who are nominated. And basically their, their criteria, it's been a while since I've looked at their website, but Last I checked, their primary criterion was not taking corporate PAC money of any kind, not taking corporate money. So they rely entirely on grassroots funding. Um, but I think wh whether it's officially a Justice Democrat requirement or whether it's sort of more informal, I think the definition of progressive has uh, expanded to include support for Medicare for all. Basically, if you don't support that, a lot of people who consider themselves left progressives uh, will not consider you a progressive. Um, so I think it's tricky too because there's different versions of Medicare for all out there. Mm, that's true. I mean, even you don't want to get too uh, much into the weeds of policies. 
Sure, but just as an example, Bernie Sanders' bill and Pramila Jayapal's bill, you know, Bernie being in the Senate and Jayapal being in the House, they were a little bit different. Uh, so, but I think overall, the idea is that we're all on a single payer system that covers everybody and covers basically any kind of medical problem that anyone could conceivably have. Like Bernie's bill included dental coverage and all sorts of other things, things that even Canadians don't have. Like in Canada, uh, I believe vision and uh, uh, dental, and I know specifically dental is uh, separate from their, um, I don't remember what they call their program, but their universal health care. So um, well, that makes sense to me. Uh, those two things would be fairly clear. One, where's your money coming from? <laughs> That's that you can check. And the other being, you know, your position on universal health care as opposed to, I suppose, something um, public private mix like the Affordable Care Act with all of its um, problems and gaps. So let's get into it, though. You, you mentioned uh, we started off with the the four incumbents that people usually know as the squad. Uh, is it mm -hmm. true that they all come from fairly left-leaning districts so that the big race was in the primary and once they got the primary in the bag, they pretty much could cruise to victory? Is, is that perception accurate? Um, I think that's accurate for AOC. Omar, I believe as well, uh, and Presley, I think so. I, th I think the biggest question during the uh, during this last primary, at least, was whether Rashida Tlaib would stay in there because it was a highly contested primary before. But you're asking about moving on to the general. Um, I think it's probably fair to say that they were pretty safe districts that once you won the primary, the Democrat would win no matter uh, who it was, whether it was a progressive or not despite claims that, I mean, I mean, there was a lot of talk that uh, incumbents would probably be destroyed by the Republicans or whatever, because they're socialists, and it was completely not the case. Apparently not, they're still there, right? Apparently they not, they're still there, there and they won, years. yeah, they won handily, like, I, I, AOC, I don't have the numbers directly in front of me, but AOC is like over 70%. I know there was a big uh, financial push for her Republican opponent, did the mm -hmm. others confront that as well? Were were the Republicans targeting them? The rest? Oh of yes, them, with absolutely, absolutely. You know, they wanted to get rid of Ilhan Omar and Tlaib. Um, I I don't know entirely about Presley. I I, I didn't. I, I haven't looked at hers, uh, but. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. Uh, there, there was a lot of money going and trying to defeat them, both in the primary and then in uh, the general. And did the Democrats do anything to help them once they had the nomination? I mean, like the, the, the Democratic establishment, were they putting any money into the race, giving them any aid and comfort? Not much, if, <laughs> if, if any. The Democratic Party obviously itself takes a lot of corporate money. I mean, they vote their, the, the DNC voted to start taking fossil fuel money again. So I think in some cases, these progressives, when they win, are also leery of taking a lot of money and support from the democratic establishment because of where that money comes from. But even still, it'd be nice to see the establishment at least trying to help them. <laughs> <laughs> and in a lot of cases, they don't. Um, one particular example comes to mind, and it's not in this election, it was in 2018. Ben Jealous uh, won the uh, primary as governor of, I'm sorry, I don't have further details on that. It just sort of came to mind. But um, I expect you to know yeah, everything. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate that. But he was completely abandoned by the Democratic Governors Association. Mm -hmm. he, he wanted help from them, and they wouldn't help him. I guess this is going a little afield of what we were planning to talk uh, about. It is. But, <laughs> but I'm also wondering, okay, if they're not taking corporate money and the Democrats are not helping them, where's the money coming from? Just email lists and uh, 
you know, small donors via the web? Is that the main um, I I would say so, yes. A lot of these candidates get money. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, you know, out of state money. But, you know, I mean, I personally donated to all of them. And I well, live I in Oregon. a lot of emails now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, emails and texts. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Yeah, that's the yeah. Your your name gets shared. You're, okay, so where would it you like to go be. from here? Maybe I should let you talk about something you were actually prepared <laughs> to talk about. Oh, oh no, no, I'm I'm perfectly happy to answer questions. Uh, but but yeah, um, I guess we should move on to you know other people who won their races. Jamal Bowman in New York. He's in the 16th of New York. He won handily, which was expected. Obviously, the big upset was when he ousted Elliot Angle, who was a big power player in the Democratic Party. But as you asked before about the incumbents, whether they would sort of coast to victory in the uh, general, it was pretty well understood that Bowman would coast to victory. And he did, um, which is good, in my opinion. Mondaire Jones, who I just mentioned there, who is from uh, New York's 17th, had a harder, a harder battle to fight and won it, thankfully. Uh, Marie Newman in uh, Illinois, 3rd District, uh, won her uh, general election, thankfully, uh, after ousting Dan Lipinski in the uh, primary. Dan Lipinski? Yeah. He's been around a while. He has. He has. And he's anti-gay, anti-abortion, <laughs> and received Nancy Pelosi's endorsement. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, Newman won. Cori Bush won, and she was in Missouri's first, again, ousting a long-term representative, uh, Lacey Clay. Yeah, it was in the primary that she ousted him. Uh, ironically, he had spent years uh, gerrymandering um, th his district so that he would maintain power, and then she comes in, ousts him, and then coasts to victory. I mean, it was almost entirely assured that she was going to win, as it had been gerrymandered before in Lacey Clay's favor and then in hers. So he did her a favor. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, Cori Bush, the name is more familiar because she's been in the news. I guess she was a leader in the Black Lives Matter movement for quite a while. So she was a spokesperson that early on was given time on media. She's also a nurse and a pastor. You know, she has a pretty good background. Okay, so where were we at? Uh, we had the five incumbents who won, and then you named three. Uh, I guess these are all people that are have been vetted by Justice Democrats: Jamal Bowman, um, Marie Newman, Marie Newman, Cory Bush, Cory Bush, and oh, there's one other that is yes, Mondaire Jones. I don't, I don't remember if he's specifically a Justice Democrat. I think he had the endorsement of the DSA and the PCCC, which is the Progressive Congressional Change uh, Committee, and DSA. In case anyone doesn't know is the Democratic Socialists of America. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the House, uh, th those people that I've named are the House, like uh, the progressive candidates for the House that won. Um, unfortunately, there were a number of losers. I don't know, maybe I should say people who lost, they're not losers. <laughs> um, but uh, I mean, I should give some mention as well to people that I would not necessarily consider progressive in the modern definition, but like Katie Porter uh, has made a name for herself as, you know, an outspoken member of the House. She was elected in 2018. She also won and she's California's 45th district. And Peter DeFazio won, I think. That was pretty much guaranteed. I, I was I would have been very surprised if Scarlatos had won against him. It was a pretty close margin though, like five percent last I checked. So it That's was closer than, say, Art Robinson ever got. Yeah, it's enough to make you sweat. Yes, indeed, indeed. So there were a number, as I said, of progressives who did not win, unfortunately, uh, their races. Uh, Carr Eastman mm. in uh, Nebraska 
uh, second district. She tried in 2018, unfortunately lost. Um, she, she won her primary then and then lost in the general, won her primary again this year and unfortunately lost in the general. And she is a justice Democrat, um, you know, so no corporate money, Medicare for all, all that goodness. So that, that was a sadness when I heard about that. One race that I was kind of looking at uh, for quite a while was the race between Shahid Buttar and Nancy Pelosi. Uh, as you probably know, and uh, but some people watching may not know, California has what's called a jungle primary. So everyone runs in the same primary regardless of their party. Yeah. And then the top two vote getters go on to the general election. So you can get a Democrat and a Republican in the general. And you can get, for instance, two Republicans in the general, or in this case, two Democrats in the general. So it's, it's actually familiar to vote. It should be familiar to voters in Oregon. It's what we call top two here. And we have it for most of our nonpartisan elections, like here in Eugene, true. where we both live in this, this yesterday's election, we had Democrat running against Democrat in a couple of races here in Eugene. That's true. Um, like, uh, are you talking about like the commissioner's uh, races? Yeah. yeah like, commissioner, yeah. city council. Um, but you, you were talking, I, I've heard of Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, well, somebody else course. got into the top two with her. Yes. Uh, Shahid Buttar. Uh, he's a longtime civil rights advocate. Uh, he's a lawyer. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he's been involved in progressive politics for a long time. And he got into the top two with her. Unfortunately, I think it's fair to say he got stomped. I'm not sure how California's works, but usually if you get 50% in the primary, you're the only candidate in the general. Um, did Pelosi get less than 50% in the primary? That's not how it works in California. Okay. It doesn't matter how much you win. It's just it's the top just, two. It's just the top two. As, and I believe Pelosi got like <laughs> the lion's share of the vote, far above 50% in the primary and has stomped uh Buttar, unfortunately and it's also unfortunate that and this probably hurt him um a few months ago there was what i consider to be and i think a large number of people consider to be a uh, a fraudulent accusation of sexual misconduct and uh gender bias in his campaign in terms of the way he would treat his staffers um and so you know treating women worse than you treat men by most accounts this is not true but the media ran with it i'm not sure that that not happened he won but it probably contributed to the degree to which he lost against pelosi you know i mean she's a known name and even when people don't like their incumbent often enough, mm. if they're familiar, it's like, you know, you know, <laughs> stick with them. I'll vote for this person. Yeah, the, the incumbency advantage is not insignificant. I, I agree with that. So even uh, when you want change. So you gave me a, a fairly lengthy list of people uh, that we were just covering the House. We didn't even get to the Senate. But yeah, uh, can you like, do you have a summary impression over in the House, at least, whether progressives are making headway? Are they like standing still? Um, you know, have, did they lose any seats? Not just did they were they trying for a seat that they didn't hold and didn't make it. But were there some who held seats that lost? Well, what I would consider progressive, like the squad and other justice Democrats. No, they did not lose any seats. Um, in fact, I would say they gained. Um, you know, we've got Mondaire Jones, Jamal Bowman, uh, Corey Bush, uh, Marie Newman. Um, it's not a huge gain. And I think it's important to note that the Democratic Party did not do well in this election overall. W regardless of whether Biden wins, 
it'll be by a narrow margin, most likely. And the House, I mean, the, the Democrats, lot, you know, they didn't lose their majority, but they their majority shrank a bit. So far um, in the House, the Republicans have gained a net of six seats. So, so they've actually flipped eight seats um, the Democrats have flipped two, and so they, you know, their majority has so far shrunk by six, but there's still um, 40 seats remaining to be determined. But if it's true that you got a few more progressives by the Justice Democrat standard, and you've got less Democrats, then there must be a greater proportion of progressive <laughs> Democrats within the party, within the by Congress. a small. By a small amount, yes. Uh, a few, um, what I would consider centrists, um, even right-wing Democrats, have lost. Um, Donna Shalala in Florida. Yeah, um, she, I remember she her was from involved. Bill Clinton's administration. Yeah. Exactly. I was going to mention she was she was she was in Bill's uh, administration. So she just lost her seat. Usually, put Bill Clinton and progressive in the same in the same sentence there. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I generally don't either, without the word not, at least. Um, yeah. But, uh, but you know, I, you know, th these are centrists or, you know, uh, right-wing Democrats uh, that I'm just mentioning here. That, so that were lost, you, that lost, yeah. That lost, yes. And uh, Xochitl uh, Torres Small in, um, I don't know, she was another prominent, uh, she won in 2018 you know, came in with the blue wave and she just lost her seat. Um, she's not what I would consider a progressive, but still, you know, that's part of the, the shrinking majority uh, of the Democrats in the well, House. Well, we're now going to have a very big argument in the Democratic Party about why the Democrats didn't do better. And of course, the centrists are going to say it's because we were tagged with the label socialist because of all these progressives and the progressives are going to say no it's because you didn't go far enough to convince people you're going to make their lives better and you just got this tepid <laughs> program <laughs> that you're offering watered down medicare for all watered down green deal <laughs> and all the rest that my bias shows here a little bit as well um so we've been almost a half an hour on here you want to give a a, a quick summary of things in the senate did did were there very many New senators coming in, new progressives? Uh, right now, four seats are still up for grabs. Um, I don't believe any of them are progressive, uh, but Marquita Bradshaw was running in Tennessee. I would consider her a progressive. Uh, lost, unfortunately. Paula Jean Swearingen, I can't even, I can't believe this didn't come to mind initially. This one hurt quite a bit. Uh, she was running in West Virginia uh, against uh, Shelley Moore Capito. Uh, lost, unfortunately. Uh, she she had uh, she'd run in 2018 against Joe Manchin in the primary. Uh, got a a surprisingly good uh, showing of about 30 percent, considering that she was a no name. You know, she'd had no governmental experience at all uh, running against Manchin. Um, and then this time she won the primary. Um, she just she lost. <laughs> it's, it's a point of sadness for me. I was uh, very much hoping I'm looking that she at would the list. win. But I'm sorry. I'm looking at the list you gave me earlier. The senators, and I think most of them were were not incumbents. Like Sarah Gideon, I know her. Mm -hmm. from, I was watching Maine because of the ranked choice voting, which didn't come into play because. Susan Collins, the Republican, got 51%. Amy McGrath, she's not an incumbent, right? Um, Jamie no, Harris, she was, Jamie she was Harrison, running. He's not an incumbent. So you, you had That's a lot correct. of incumbents who managed to win the primary. I mean, you had a lot of progressives who managed to win the Democratic primary, but then lost in the general election. That's correct. Unfortunately, the Senate was not... Uh, it was not, you know, the progressives were not victorious at all, really, in the Senate. I mean, Unless you include Jeff Merkley. 
Uh, yeah, he he kept his seat. His he defended it from. Oh, I'm spacing on her name. Uh, the, yeah, Joe Ray Perkins. The that's it. Most famous for her, you know, support of QAnon. Um, <sighs> yeah, well, I'm glad that he defended his seat from her. And Ed Markey, I think he's somewhere in between a uh, liberal and a progressive. Um, he's I mean, he signed on to the Green New Deal early on. Um, I don't remember what his stance on Medicare for All is. I think he signed on to it with Bernie, but I'm not 100% sure. But um, you know, he, he managed to defend his seat, uh, which, I mean, he was in Massachusetts. As, well, not, not necessarily guaranteed. Massachusetts is a weird state. They their Democrats are pretty progressive. And then you got a lot of Republicans. I mean, Mitt Romney was governor of Massachusetts for a while. Right. Um, so I, I think uh, they just uh, had a ranked choice voting measure that failed there too, somewhere mm. in the Northeast. Um, but That's we should, we should probably sum it up. It'll be interesting to watch going forward. Um, how much influence they have within the caucus in the uh, house. Doesn't sound like much, progress in the Senate. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it's also been a bad year for Democrats compared. I mean, this is two presidential elections in the row where the prognostications for how well Democrats were going to do were way off. Um, Absolutely. I mean, this should have been a layup, but Trump, you know, he's very likely to lose. Uh, based on the mail-in votes that are still to be counted in the states that are still up for grabs. But he, he outperformed the, the, the polls. Uh, and I think, I mean, right now, the, he's got, according to New York Times, 68 and a half million popular votes to Joe Biden, 72, and, and a half million. That's a lot of people. Um, 68 million. That is, a, that is a lot of people, and that is a lot of people who are also going to vote Republican down ballot. Yeah. Um, so you, you can't just write them off as a, like a fanatic minority. Somehow we have to take seriously whatever it is that they, uh, uh, they all have different views of Trump, I'm sure. They're not all in it for the same reasons. But Democrats have to no, take I, that seriously. They do, and I, I think that taking that seriously means seriously starting to embrace more popular politics. Because it should, you know, like in Florida, they just passed a huge increase to their minimum wage by like a two-thirds majority. And yet a majority of Floridians still voted for Trump, who opposes the minimum wage itself. So progressive policies have actually won quite a bit throughout the country so far. I mean, there's been a lot of cannabis legalization uh, for recreational use. Um, and, and yet in a lot of those states where that has happened, they also then turned around and voted for Republicans. The so, Democratic Party is a damaged brand. <laughs> It is. They thought it the is. Republicans and were damaged, but apparently the Democrats haven't recovered their uh, their shininess for too many people. That, I, I would say that that's true, and and unfortunately, the Democratic leadership is going to look at this and say, "Oh, we got to move further to the right to try to appeal to Republicans who <laughs> historically do not vote for Republican light." Well, we're going to be watching that. Maybe we'll bring you back if you're paying more attention to Congress as they go forward. I'd love to hear what's happening. I would love to. All right. Uh, any any final parting words for the audience? Well, I would say have hope. The Progressive Caucus is expanding. It's slow, but, you know, Americans tend to vote conservatively regardless of their actual positions, you know, not capital C conservative, but we are expanding. And I think 
we just got to keep moving forward, keep fighting. Sometimes things move slow, sometimes they move fast. I mean, perspective is important. When I, when I think of the, the time I've been watching politics, the last four years, things seem to be moving fast, even though it's not fast enough for a lot of people. But this, uh, this is a big change since 2016. Anyway, I good, agree. To, good to see you. Good to talk again. And uh, we'll look forward to talking again sometime. Yeah, it's great being on. Thank you.